Hi, this is Jennifer Reeder, and my new film, Perpetrator, will world premiere at um, this upcoming uh, Berlinale in the panorama section. Stay out of my stuff. This is not your stuff. You want me to give it back? I want you to eat it. Eat what? Pick something and eat it. No. What you did was stupid and selfish. Trust me, a girl like you cannot afford to be stupid and selfish. No one is going to miss any of this. Would you prefer that I pick something for you? Hello and welcome to the 37th Teddy Award. My name is Jan Felix Wuttig and today I'm here with Jennifer Reeder to discuss her film Perpetrator. Hello Jennifer, pleased to have Hi you. Hi Jan, how are you? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for Perpetrator. I found it was this incredible uh, mix of um, a coming of age drama of a horror film um, also very much, at least to, to my mind, um, a social commentary in, in a way. Um, maybe you could start with telling us a little bit about how it just the idea for the film came to pass. Sure. Um, well, you know, so many of my um, my short films and um, one of my most recent films, Knives and Skin, which also world premiered, world had its world premiere in 2019 at the Berlinale. Uh, deal with um, the experiences of of, um, of young people and specifically um, adolescent girls or teenage girls, and so often in the Q and A's and the and the press, I would have this question about um, how is it to work with so many teenage girls, and my answer was always quite positive. Great, I love these mm -hmm. girls; are amazing. That's why I tell their stories. But the more that I got asked that question, the more I realized that. The person asking it, the meaning in it was that for them, the idea of working with so many girls, having so many girls on all together on a set was um, a horror film in it in its in itself. <laughs> and so, you know, I just began to to realize actually over the past several years that, you know, um, you know, at least in, in in American culture, but I think this extends, you know, sadly all over the world that we have an obsession with youth and beauty, especially among young women. And yet we do kind of everything that we can to disrupt their evolution. You know, we also hate young women. Um, and, you know, so I, and I thought about the language that we use to diminish a young woman, especially if she has sort of agency over her sexuality or she has, she is, she's independent and, and, uh, uh, and, and has forged a, a very specific path for her life. We might say something like, that girl is wild and out of control. And that certainly is not meant as um as a compliment. It's not meant to 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 give her more agency. It's meant to really to diminish her to diminish her her agency. And I'm being sort of binary right now, but it is the case that that's not always what, you know, sort of boy presenting boys mm -hmm. get told. Um True. so I had this thought that I wanted to make a proper horror film. For instance, where Knives and Skin is kind of genre adjacent, I wanted to make a, a very, you know, a film that was had some gory horror, had some good jump scares. Um, but that started with this idea of a of a of a wild and out of control girl who becomes wild and out of control. And so, like the thing that 
that is used to diminish her becomes her superpower. Mm -hmm. And which is a theme that I've that I've used before. Um, and so, it, and it, you know, it was the, a kind of a slow molding of this idea of um, of a girl who who inherits shape shifting abilities on her 18th birthday. You know, what would that look like, knowing that I didn't want her to be a vampire or a werewolf or some kind of more common iteration of the of the shapeshifter. And yet I still wanted to think about this idea of um, of of this uh, this more even visceral obsession with with youth and beauty um, and how that might play into this other subplot of, of missing girls uh, and not, um, not just, dis, not dissimilar to my other films. Also, I really wanted to think about the idea of like um, what we inherit from the, from the, from the people in our lives, a legacy of, of women shapeshifters, all of whom are supporting mm -hmm. each other. You know, again, this idea of, of um, female friendships as a survival strategy. Yeah. Um, well, one of, one of the things since you, uh, one of the things that you did, you mentioned it right now, is one of the things I loved about the film because it it turned that very common accusation of you know don't be too emotional, don't be hysterical, all that stuff kind of into into something extremely positive, into a superpower. Mm. Um, but I'm I'm kind of <laughs> getting ahead of myself again. Um, um, but. Touching on that, uh, you have some incredible performers right there, and uh, there are also so many, um, a couple of very intimate scenes, a couple of very, you know, scenes that, that people might find hard to deal with in terms of, you know, like liquids and, and, and body fluids. Or <laughs> um, Could you tell us a little bit about how you worked with the performers to, to, to kind of um, get the scenes that you wanted? Yeah, you know, the this the both sort of like the beneficial part to writing a, a script like this and also the really sad part about writing a script like this is when you begin to attach young women to these parts, they know this world very well. You know, they know they know the idea of being of being stripped for parts, so to say, um, of being reduced down to their to their bodies. And um so you know, working with the actors to make sure that they felt, um, you know, seen on set and safe on set, specifically in scenes that were uh, that that were really a about the kind of more horrific moments um, in 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 this film. And th there was a there was a, w a woman that we had spoken to kind of earlier early on who read the script and said, "I I can't even." Um, you know, think about attaching myself to this film. It just is actually too close to something very traumatic that happened to me that I'm still not over. And I certainly didn't write a script or make this film to be to be triggering to to audiences. I do want it to feel authentic. I do want us to to consider the the, the potential like everyday horror film that could be the life of any of any young person just trying to kind of navigate this world. Um, and that certainly extends to, you know, queer kids and trans kids, um, you know, sort of all, all, all over the, all over the world. Um, and I was very lucky to, to be able to attach someone like Kaya mm -hmm. um, Kiernan, who plays Johnny, who's just really fantastic, who was on set every single day. I mean, she is in every single scene. <laughs> um, she really had to own this role yeah. and, you know, for lack of a better pun, I guess, really sew herself into the skin of that, of this um, character. And then when we were able to attach the iconic Alicia Silverstone, you know, that was, it was also really great to work with her because, you know, she's been around for so long. We, we know her, I think, as this, and we were introduced to her rather as a teenager in a very iconic teenage film, which is still has lots of super fans. In fact, there's the you know the the Super Bowl in the United States is coming up on Sunday, and there's a um, a commercial spot that she's reprising her role as Cher yeah. in um, in in Clueless, um, and she loved the script. She loved all the weirdnesses. She loved Hildy as a character. Yeah. Um, she's made some very interesting choices recently. I mean, she had a small part in um, Killing of a Sacred Deer, for instance. She was in a really interesting genre film called The Lodge. I mean. You know she's a, she's a very smart um, 
very like layered, you know, mm-hmm. actor and person and, and activist. And so she really understood at the core what this film was about. Um, and then being able to attach Chris Lowell, who, you know, also has been doing a lot of American TV that sort of, you know, is is potentially very, very kind of conventional. So mm-hmm. so he and he really has the heart of an artist. So I think when this script yeah. came along to him, you know, he had been looking also for something that, you know, he could really kind of sink his teeth into. Um, and same with Melanie Libert, you know, who who has been on shows like This Is Us, you know, a very kind of sort of normal American, you know, family drama. Um, and she really, you know, loved everything about this, about the script and this, and this character. So, you know, attaching the actors was not, was not difficult. Yeah. And then, you know, just making sure that, that really when we would shoot some of the, 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 the sort of tougher scenes that, that everybody, you know, that those people in front of the camera, all of them, including all the supporting, you know, actors who I think are tremendously great, uh, just making sure that 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 I was like I was sort of a good a good mother, you mm-hmm. know, and make sh- made sure that everybody felt felt sort of like taken care of and nourished at the at the end of the day. Because really, you know, Perpetrator, even though it's the, my most ambitious film um, to date, it still feels like it's really carved right out of my own heart. Yeah, and I, I think that that really um, <laughs> translates well on on screen. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with the um, with the microphone apparently. Oh. So much, so much green. I like that you have a green <laughs> couch and there's a green sweater. I have a green background. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. We have the, the the green sofa and and this is what mm-hmm. one of my colleagues referred to as a dead dog. Um, well, <laughs> died for a noble cause at least. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, um, sorry about the uh, the. Uh, well, anyway. Um, one of one of the things that I um, found that that well, first of all, I, I think that all of what you said just now really comes across and it really translates well on the on the screen because um, both the casting and the story itself they, they just kind of transform into this. I found this very powerful tale of of kind of female legacy or female her- heritage, and then then. Um, you also have that informed by different, different various scenes. Like for example, you have this um, queer love scene, and I just kind of felt it. It it really empowered that that idea of um, you know women working together through the ages um, to ensure their own safety, but to ensure their own power as well. Um, but maybe you could tell us in your own words how how um, what aspect that queer kind of relationship kind of love scene had had for you. Yeah, I always knew that I wanted that I actually wanted Johnny's sexuality to be really fluid, and there was there was actually a scene that we shot that was in the film for a long time that we ended up um, cutting out. Um, where she was with two other different people. This was well before she arrived at Hildy's house. And so she was with um, two friends of hers, a boy and a girl, and they were all kind of in this really great um, kind of teen sex pile, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and it was a great scene and I, and, I, and I stand by it. We just understood that in test audiences, with test screenings, people wanted Johnny to get to Hildy's house faster. It was a very, um, mm-hmm. just a kind of a practical decision. We cut out a couple other really great scenes too that I will recycle, which I always do. I'll put those in another film. <laughs> um, but I wanted Johnny's, you know, sexuality to to be fluid because I actually think that that's very authentic to um, not just how young people, you know, live nowadays, but how, how you know, people always felt maybe were, and were not as able you know, then when they were growing up to, to express that. Uh, but I wanted Johnny's sexuality to feel, you know, to feel authentic. And, I, but I did want her kind of main sort of more, more consistent love interest to be um, another girl. And I wanted sort of both of them though, to have a kind of, um, you know, like a tomboy quality or a kind mm-hmm. of a gender fluid quality, which I also believe is very authentic to the experiences of so many young people now. And, um, 
you know, whether or not their pronouns stay one way or their pronouns change, um, you know, from kind of week to week, there is a real, um, a real fluidity to, to desire and to, you know, gender presentation, which I wanted to, um, you know, I, I wanted to, which I think is authentic. And I wanted to, to bring that into, I wanted to bring that into this film. Uh, and I didn't want to make, you know, well, so often when there, when you have a, like a female protagonist who seems to be like a very strong willed person, whether they're a teenager or they're adult, oftentimes, especially if the film, the story, the character is being authored by a male presenting person, um, the first characteristic of a strong woman is that she has no sex life. Mm. I don't know how many times I've gotten a <laughs> script where it's about, you, you know, like that I haven't written. It's about a rookie FBI agent who uncovers yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, a kind of a Clarice Starling yeah, meets yada, exactly. yada, yada. Yeah. <laughs> and and they have they've just completely erased or ignored her her sex life, you know, as mm. though women really have to choose to be sort of like sexual beings or strong, empowered people in the world. And so I knew that I wanted, you know, for Johnny, who seems like there's, she's got this kind of tough exterior to have a vulnerability, especially around Electra and to feel like she could be soft and open around Electra, that she trusts um, Electra almost immediately. And, you know, Electra, who is curious about her is not afraid of her. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what, and sort of what she's going through. She's very curious about it, which I also think feels, you know, feels, feels relative, feels, feels authentic also. Yeah. And I didn't want to make, you know, those scenes were always, ex were always written to not be overly graphic. You know, I think that where I wanted some of the more horrific elements to feel kind of mm -hmm. graphic, I wanted those kind of intimate moments to remain within the desire of those two girls. You know, I think, I think a lot of, um, you know, kind of queer sex scenes, especially if they're, you know, among female presenting people can, can maybe feel too, um, too much leaning into, you know, what is desirable for um, cis het men, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know that's, that's sort of like, I can't, I can't know what, what someone will, will be drawn to, sure. but I also just knew that I wanted that the desire in the film to really remain with those with those two characters and to feel you know to feel to feel sweet and exploratory yeah um what you, what you touched upon right now was that uh which i also found an incredible part of the film was how well you deconstructed male authority figures in in the film because there's so much you know, it's 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 funny at times. It's very very daring. At other times, it's it's you know, it's um, I don't know the the ignorant father or the the mm -hmm. sleazy teacher or the mm -hmm. the violent policeman. Um, mm -hmm. um, maybe you could say in your own words how how you kind of approach these these figures and work to to kind of you know <laughs> put them down a peg in a in a sense, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I, and I mean, I have a I have a, a solid answer for that. And I would also just preface it by saying, you know, I mean, I I, I also you know deeply love and respect so many of the of the of the men and of the men in my life, and um, you you know, I so I, so it's not as though the, my the these male characters that I that I write who seem to be so deeply egotistical and yet so fragile is some kind of state on all of on all of manhood, but I think that you know, after, you know, and we still haven't sort of survived, you know, the, the Trump era um, America, but, you know, it does, it does feel like that, that, you know, the, among so many, uh, so, so many men for whom, um, you know, clinging to their, you know, dusty patriarchal power is, um, it's so, it's so pathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and yet they, there's still so many, you know, men who remain in very, very powerful political positions, making, you know, doing much more than just being a sort of inept high school principal or, you know, a kind of, you know, a beat, beat cop in a small neighborhood yeah. in, you know, kind of rural Illinois. Um, you know, there are people, there are men who are just as egotistical and just as, as, um, you know, fragile and frankly, you know, sort of dumb uh, that that are in very, very powerful positions to make very 
um, impactful decisions about people's about people's lives for whom their experience is are are the complete opposite. And yeah. so, um, you know, I I uh, I mean, I love all those. I love the, you know all all three of those those characters that you mentioned and. And, um, you know, those actors, I mean, Tim Hopper, who I've worked, who, who plays the, who plays Johnny's father, mm -hmm. who I worked with previously in Knives and Skin. I just love him as an actor. Um, he, he, you know, he plays that kind of lost man so well. And, you know, Chris and, and, um, and Josh, who play our, our cop and our, and our, our principal were also really game to play those, you know, yeah. to play those characters, even though, you know, they understand entirely that, you know, as actual people, you know, I don't have a film with, without amazing performances. And those performances come from three, you know, very woke men, very mm -hmm. feminist <laughs> men, very, you know, yeah. and um, so that's part of it, you know, being, being able to, uh, to understand that. Um, and I think, you know, they all have, they obviously, all three of them have little secrets, you know, that we, that, that get revealed that make them not just one dimensional. I mean, they don't, they don't redeem them by any, by any way. I mean, maybe the father, I'm not going to give, give, give that away, but yeah. <laughs> um, they, they aren't simply one dimensional creeps. No, no, that's true. And I also found that, that there's a lot of humor to them as well, you know, as, as, dangerous or as offensive as as their actions might be at times there's also like a lot of uh playfulness with with how they act and and how it's used in the film i think so i think that both i think that you know the 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 the, the cop and the, the the high school principal each have some of my very favorite funny lines in yeah. the film <laughs> yeah exactly uh, uh I mean, there's so many great scenes, but specifically the scene where the the the, the principal kind of bursts in with his water soaker gun and just shoots the three pupils, you know, with with mm -hmm. with like, um, well, fake blood, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it just, I don't know, the the creative the the creativity behind that, I I just. <laughs> yeah, I found it incredible. Um, I'm really interested too to in that scene in particular. You know, I'm very curious to see how that how audiences um react to that and mm -hmm. i hope that they that people really understand that there's nothing about that scene that's that is celebrating you know gun violence it's actually mm -hmm. sort of being very critical of the way yeah. that at least in in the united states there you know lawmakers have no ability to or have no I interest really into into um uh, reforming gun laws and you know we are we are just about at the at the place where where you know one would um incentivize victims not mm -hmm. to be shot you know yeah. i mean that's that's what that scene sort of is you know is a is about and so there's 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 humor in that scene but it certainly shouldn't be the case that like that i find anything about gun violence humorous which no, i hope no. comes across no certainly not but i found that that did you really put a light to that issue from very different perspectives as well like from mm -hmm. you know it, it criticizes gun violence it it um it speaks about that issue but it also kind of you know it, it criticizes that that male struggle for control as well it has some amazing lines and and yeah i, I thought there was there was a lot together from that scene um Great. Uh, just just one one um small one there um how did you kind of think about um um you know lighting and sound concerning the film because i i found that it it has this, this incredible lighting you know it, you have some very you know scenes that that it could be taken straight out of some sort of film noir mm -hmm. and at the same time you have this incredible soundtrack so um i mean those are two big pieces of a film always but maybe you could tell us a little bit about how, how you approached those two topics yeah absolutely so the 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 cinematographer the dop who i worked with this time around i'd never worked with her before her name is sabdia castrati um she is, is la based but is originally from from kosovo and um you know we we talked a lot about what the the color the lighting should be and um 
were very careful to to make something that felt very different from knives and skin for instance knives and skin is just like soaked and pinks and purples and and the lighting is is not always um it doesn't always feel like it's it's representing reality and so we wanted the light in um and perpetrator to feel grounded in the in the real world but absolutely to to lean into sort of the darker corners or mm -hmm. you know in terms of a palette um you know for everything that's not the perpetrator's house let's say we wanted to feel like we're leaning into these kind of navy blues and mm -hmm. ambers and yeah. and um you know which was a which is a very different color palette than um than knives and skin uh and to and to and for the sound design um, I worked with the same company um, that did Knives and Skin that's called Another Country here in Chicago. And what I love working with that sound designer, Drew Weir, is that he doesn't simply look and say, okay, someone's walking here, we put footsteps. Someone's mm -hmm. eating here, we put some crunching sounds. Yeah. You know, he's thinking about what is the kind of psychological aura of a scene. And so, you know, his 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 sound design is so complicated uh, so, for instance, when the minute that we go into Hildy's house, you hear none of the outside world. You mm -hmm. only hear the ticking of this little clock. And so we made an we really wanted that to be very specific that 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 within kind of Hildy's house, the whole rest of the world sort of falls away, that yeah, you've kind of yeah. go, gone into a strange portal um, in her house. And then we finally hear a little bit of the outside world, um, you know, kind of almost at the at the at the at the end when there's been sort of a radical change in in many of the characters uh and so little little details like that i i think can elevate a film like this to can just elevate a film like this um and give it a much more full experience and nick zinner who's the guitar player for the yeah yeah yeah's amazing um rock band uh, he did the score for Knives and Skin, which was very synthy, very kind of music box kind of sound. Um, and I, I wanted him to do the score for Perpetrator, which he did. Mm -hmm. And I said, it has to be darker and deeper and meaner and gr <laughs> grungier, you know? Yeah. And so, which obviously he can do. Um, and so he had a, he had a uh, blast like working on this on this score, you know, because yeah. we would, you know, he would give us something and sometimes it was just perfect. And then sometimes I was like, it has to be more terrifying. And he was like, <laughs> okay, you know, and then he would, he would come back with something, you know, that just like gets into your spinal fluid, mm. you know? And so I think that the whole experience, um, you know, and being able to watch it, you know, um, in Berlin with all of those things finally together, which I have seen, but not in a giant, you know, projection, of course, like at my beloved Zoo Palast, which is my favorite <laughs> theater. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a very um, rich and whole experience for an audience. Um, and at the end of the day, this film is still really a, a real indie. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this was still a very scrappy budget. We called in a lot of favors. Um, people did this project because they you know, they love this project, not because it was like a gigantic paycheck. And so, you know, but with all of my films, what I really want to do is to, you know, to, to sort of like feel like something is, is, um, is really handcrafted at each, like it's highly curated. Each frame of this film is highly curated, which is very typical of what I've done previously. Yeah. And I, I think actually um, uh, people are going to love it. Like people are going to, they're going to laugh a lot. They're going to think a lot about, about, different scenes and then you know mostly i think they're going to walk out of the cinema and and think that that perpetrator is a, an incredibly rich film you know it has so many different aspects um, i really hope so because it feels like such a beast you know yeah. i mean it just <laughs> it feels like a real it was a long time getting this film made pr primarily because we were going to shoot it in 2020 and we all know how the world shut down in 2020 um and you know, I, I I just really hope that that, you know, audiences love it and to bring it back to, you know, to bring a film like this um, to be returning to Berlin, but with a film like this, which is so properly genre, um, you know, I'm it's not I'm not taking it for granted at all, you know, that the Berlin all programmers, you know, really wanted this for the for the world premiere. I mean, it's it's very validating. So yeah. but I hope that it translates. I understand that it's probably not going to be for everyone, but I 
but I really hope that the Knives and Skin super fans love it and that it actually, you know, broadens broadens my audience in general. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely certain that it will find its audience and find its people. Uh, Jennifer, mm. thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I think that's it for me. Um, yeah, I'm thank you again for Perpetrator and um, I'm very much looking forward to meeting you in Berlin. Great, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> she's being too she's being really too loud